Hello, everyone. I'm Paul. I've got something to say about functional versus non-functional requirements. Non-functional is a very, very bad term. It speaks to all sorts of historic and old mindsets. And here's what I want to do. I want to say, what, what else? What else would we use for a term to describe things that are very important, but not the same as the traditional model of functional? My proposal is we actually use the word operational. So it should be functional versus operational. Requirements, work, whatever. And why is non-functional such a problem, right? The current situation that we have, it relegates all these other things, security, performance, installation, deployment, uh, accessibility, testings right? Verification and validation about those things. It relegates them to a nice to have, right? It's something later on that we can deal with. Also worse, people can say, but that's not my problem. Not my forte, not my subject matter expertise, not my problem. Yet so many of our systems, where is the fundamental flaw coming from? It's coming from the moment that code is written something changes in configuration. Those places is, is where certain problems immediately start to arise. So it is your problem, but it's easy to say, not my problem, if it's non-functional and I don't do that kind of stuff. And the worst part is that it all adds up to us saying, it's not as important. Hmm. The scalability of your system is not as important as the button actually working? When the button, when it gets clicked by thousands of people, starts to degrade so badly that other people can't click it, it starts to become a functional, a very functional but operational problem. The problem here is really uh, more insidious, right? Because there's, right now, what, what allows us to live in this world is that there's no cost or risk typically tied to not doing something to ensure that that's not gonna to happen to you, that the operational things aren't going to catch you and cause problems. Um, there's, like I said before, not my problem. That's part of an umbrella uh, of, of other mentality, right? It's something other, it's somebody other, they or that is not me, right? That's, that's a bad place to be. There's also the delayed gratification or the delayed impact situation, right? That dynamic, it's easy now to ignore it, but it's hard later on. And what we do locally affects the global situation, sometimes in a very real circumstance. But even if that's just to my team, I introduce a new dependency from a third party. I don't tell anybody because I didn't even think about it. And now all of a sudden we have conflicts and dependencies that we didn't even know about preventing us from actually scaling or doing what we really wanted to do, which was in some cases make money, in other cases not make work for ourselves, right? But that delay between what we do locally and how it impacts global is actually a big problem. So I wanna reframe this for a second. If we know that something is critical, if we know security is critical or scale is critical, right, or performance and reliability is critical, we must put processes in place to ensure that thing, right? Not heavy processes, and the process might not be exactly the same everywhere, but process is very important. We need to change the incentives. Why, why am I jumping to incentives already? Well, if we've agreed, let's imagine we've agreed that functional and operational must be treated as a whole, a lot like, you know, Einstein's space time, you know, he said, wait a second, these two things are not different like we thought they were. In fact, they are integrally tied. The physics of them are integrally tied, right? They must be treated as a whole. And the same thing goes for functional and operational concerns, activities, requirements. They must be treated as a whole. This is exactly what the DevOps mindset sets us up to start to think about. In reality, though, 
why incentives? Well, th there, there are dynamics too, right? There are existing dynamics. Why, why wouldn't I start with dynamics? In reality, most of the time, dynamics are driven by the incentives in place. And so a lot of those times, yes, incentives mean money or making money or making your goal or getting your bonus or whatever it is, but it's not just about money, right? Incentives to not have to work overnight, not have to uh, have firefights in production, right? Overnight calls, those kind of things, come on. An incentive not to leak personal information out of your organization, which we all know is impossible to 100% stamp out for anybody globally, right? It's gonna happen. Scaling problems are gonna happen. But what we need to do is put incentives in place that drive dynamics that help us move the situation to a better. And that, that starts with the words we use, functional versus operational. Dynamics though, what are some of the dynamics that we have right now? Okay, so over-optimization, over-specialization, right? Dev says, it's not my job to do it because I've been, I've been told I should be cutting code. That's what I should be doing. That's what makes the company the most money, especially when it gets out to production. So I'm only responsible for the code, specialization. And specialization is important, right? Learning, building a skill set. you know, that 10,000 hours rule, you're not really an expert unless you've clocked 10,000 hours kind of thing. That actually takes time. And so people dedicate time and energy in their careers to getting good at one or two or three things, you know, the T-shaped kind of situation. But ultimately over optimization of the, the, the usage of your specialization pools leads to too much, surprise, supply and demand. The supply of new features over features that we just shipped not working well. Think about it like that which by the way, also leads to a dysfunctional uh, um, relationship with your customer base that, and your business that they, they say, well, you, you shipped five new features last month. You, you should be able to ship five this month or six this month or more, right? Right? And that leads us to a disoptimal completion, a close, proper close on what you just did now. Velocity now, right? Your team's velocity now versus maybe a future situation where it's a little more balanced, you know? Some of the SRE work talks about error budgets built on measuring SLOs and SLIs to say, hey, look, you know, we went past our budget of how many errors and how many problems we're causing. So now all of a sudden we need to pause on new work in order to reallocate a little time to fixing that thing so it's not constantly bringing us into overnight firefights, burning us out and so on and so forth, right? That cycle, we need to change that and rebalance that a little bit, right? But it's not all just a balance of the dev and the product management, product ownership space in the agile sort of burn down charts. And just because you have agile in your ops situation or in your marketing or in your sales situation, doesn't mean that we, ha we don't have to think about how this is balanced across all those groups, right? So those are some of the dynamics we live in. We need to put incentives in place to change those things to improve that situation. So a couple of examples there, incentives, balance new work with disruption and variability. Just like what I said, if, if, if you're running too many problems in production, you need to figure out how you're going to make the case to be able to say, we need to take one or two of those story points that would have been on a feature, delay that feature for a little while while we stabilize and improve this situation over here. Those things might pop up. You don't know what you don't know. So you need to build in maybe a little buffer, You know, not a huge overestimate, but a little buffer of time to say, hey, on average, Per month, we, we need to spend this much time on balancing, rebalancing the equation. You need to measure systems. Absolutely, you need to be able to measure the reliability, the security, the scalability of your systems, those kind of things, right? Those operational things. 
it's not just about NetRAM disk CPU storage cost, storage latency, right? Those are the nerdy bits, the systems. What we're talking about is also the systems that produced us the thing we wanted, which was revenue. So we need to, and in some very mature situations, we have people with dashboards that have both the system and service availabilities, as well as the revenue literally associated with those. That's great and all, right? We need to measure those systems, but we also need to measure the systems of systems. And I don't just mean systems connected up to each other. I'm talking about people systems. <clears throat> and we need to encourage rotation of duties. Rotation of duties. Wow, what a concept. Imagine if 10% of every dev in your organization's time was required to be allocated to ensuring that not only operations, but also the process by which we get to operations is improved and better. <laughs> not everybody feels like they can do that, but in reality, you can do what you want to do. You can do what you need to do. And what we need to do is of course, treat the functional and operational as a whole, remember. So how are we gonna do this? And more appropriately, who will do that? Well, first thing, we need to reduce the friction between the old rules that allowed us to function the way we have, separate silos for, it's not my problem, and the new rules. To reduce that friction, we need leadership. This is leadership follow through. It's not just enough to put a new tool in place or allow that to be budgeted or a new process. You actually have to follow through and make it a situation that's very likely to be taken on to get those benefits rather than just letting the old situation continue uh, on. Exactly how we do that. Typically, when there is a new set of rules, we want to reduce the barrier of entry for learning and trying things out. Of course, when you do that, what you get a bunch of junior people or, or senior people that are new and junior to this new thing, this new process, this, this new set of rules, you don't want that to go right out to production. You need to codify your guardrails. You need to put some things in place to make it so that as we're learning, we're not running off the tracks, right? We have some rails, we have some guardrails in place, just like bumper cars, right? There's, we don't want the people in the bumper cars to fall off and go all the way out and crash themselves and, and make a problem for it. So we put some bumpers and some guardrails in place to make sure that people are safe. We need to simplify the startup cost for entrance, right? And the cost isn't just the learning and the knowledge or the production risk, right? It's also the environments that's necessary to do these things. The, the, the yes, documentation, but the, the, the thought processes that went into the thing and the traceability and, and why a decision matters, we need to make it easy for them to understand those things, right? And simplify the, the entry cost of doing the new rules. We also need to extract the maximum value from those outputs. Because if somebody does a new rule system and it doesn't get them much of anything different than what they had the other before, maybe it's a little bit easier, marginally easier, but no new thing is easier than the thing you've already been doing because you've been doing it, you already know it. So we need to extract the maximum value out of those new work outputs so that it's absurdly easy for people to say, it might be a little bit different and new and a little bit harder. I'll, I'll learn that. But what I get out of it is far better than what we had before. So going back to that notion of functional versus operational, right? What we need to do is have uh, building blocks to some of the things that I mentioned here specifically reasonable and transparent process. Reasonable is not only, is this process onerous? Is it too much or not enough, right? It, it's gotta be balanced and just right enough, right? But it also has to be something that you can reason about, right? That other people can reason about. 
that you put it through the practice of giving it to others. And if they can get where you got mentally about the thing and go, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. Let's do it. Right. That's reasonable. A dual, dual definition there. And transparent process doesn't mean, doesn't always mean that everybody knows everything about everybody else, right? There are, there are segregation of duties. There's important pl things that you need to have in place in order to prevent, you know, inf inappropriate information sharing. But the more transparent the process is, the easier it's going to be for people to not only take it and run with it, but also suggest slightly better improvements to it, right? You also need to demyth like a myth, like bust myth, and demystify subject matter expertise. Specialization matters a lot, right? Subject matter expertise matters a lot. However, if it's all shrouded in myth and mystery of how to do this thing, nobody's going to feel like they're welcome in that space to start their learning journey, to get better at it. So, we need to demyth and demystify subject matter expertise. And once we do that, whoa, where are the subject matter experts gonna go? What are they gonna be doing? <laughs> you task the subject matter ex experts with scaling their knowledge. What are the things in place that we need to do so that we don't have to do the same things over again? Let's put that in a document. Let's codify that into some guardrails in a process. Let's build out templates for other people. Let's make it, let, it, let us be, ruthlessly invested in other people to be able to also grow and improve their knowledge of performance, reliability, security, and so on and so forth, right? And we always need to tie work to organizational imperatives. If your organization says that it's very important that their customer data be protected, that's something you can latch on to. And it makes it absurdly easy to say, this twiddly little activity work over here that I was doing for this reason ties up to our, our team, our department requirements that are tied to organizational imperatives. Very hard to argue uh, at any level about how that works. But if you're just doing work off to the side that the perception is it's unrelated to something that everybody all sees as an organizational imperative, then no wonder why it gets constantly undermined and, and re reallocated and associated. So I challenge you to challenge, <laughs> challenge yourself, challenge your teams, challenge your own mindset, right? And specifically, the nature of this video was to say, just try to use the word operational instead of non-functional. Anytime somebody in a product team or a PI planning session says, oh, that's a non-functional requirement or, oh, that's, that's like not the functional requirements, say, okay, but what you meant, I think what you meant to say was, or what I heard you say was operational requirements. And now all of a sudden people go, yeah, because we need it not only to be developed and functional, but we also need it to operate. So now it's a lot harder to argue with the importance of those other requirements that end up always being very important. When you're in those conversations, just think anytime you hear the word non-functional, I hope I haven't screwed, <laughs> screwed your brain up too much because now all you're gonna be doing is thinking when I hear the word non-functional, now I'm gonna be thinking operational. So whatever, like, subscribe, but most importantly, put a comment in the comments. Say some, like, tell me what you're thinking about this, this, this area of, of conversation. All right, see ya.